The heartbreak hid Shawn Michaels and Big Daddy Cool Diesel, two guys synonymous with the WWF's new generation and two guys equally as important to the Monday Night Wars. The story of the two dudes with attitudes goes beyond their time together in the ring though, and it even goes beyond their time together in the same company. And while their work as a tag team is interesting to look at from a TV standpoint, the stuff that went on behind the scenes, or rather the reported stuff that went on behind the scenes, is truly fascinating. A lot of fans don't like these two, a lot of fans would say Diesel and Shawn Michaels were self-serving, two guys who only cared about themselves and their closest friends. Others admire how they really didn't care who they upset as they played the political game better than anyone else in the WWF at the time. Today we'll take a close look at the two dudes with attitudes. Shawn Michaels said he needed a friend in the mid-90s. Shawn wasn't the most popular guy backstage, and Kevin Nash said in an interview that Shawn didn't only need a friend, but he also needed a real bodyguard, not just one for his TV character. Kevin said that Shawn had heat, and Shawn maybe wanted someone to look out for him both in the ring and in the locker room. HBK was the Intercontinental Champion in the spring of 1993, and a lot of his matches were ending in countouts and disqualifications. Sean reasoned that if someone was in his corner who would get involved in his matchups, then HBK would be able to claim more victories, get more heat, and it also ensured his opponents were protected by not losing clean. Sean brought this idea to Vince McMahon, and Vince wanted to know who from the existing roster did Sean have in mind. HBK said that there was no one on payroll who fit the bill, but he had been watching a guy named Vinny Vegas on WCW television who Sean thought was great. HBK got a kick out of Vinny Vegas' promos, and his large size certainly fit the bill. McMahon didn't want to discuss contracts with any WCW talent, so Sean spoke with Rick Steiner. Rick knew Vinny Vegas personally, he phoned him right away, and in order to get out of his contract, Nash told WCW management that he wanted to give up wrestling altogether in return to bouncing in nightclubs. WCW gave Kevin his immediate release, and the next day, Nash was at Vince's house discussing his new role within the World Wrestling Federation. Let this be an early indication of how Nash would play the game, and how he really didn't care as long as he was making money. Some people might not like that, others see it as Kevin doing right by Kevin. Nash was given his first assignment, he'd show up at an Albany house show and help Shawn Michaels win the Intercontinental Championship, and that's exactly what happened. Shawn Michaels said about meeting Kevin Nash, I do recall letting him know that I'd seen him, I thought he was incredibly cool, but he should know that not a lot of people here like me, and that may rub off on him a bit. At the time, he was probably the first guy who ever looked at me and said, I've got your back man. Nash then made his WWF TV debut on the June 7th 1993 episode of Raw, and he stood at ringside as HBK defeated job guy Russ Greenberg. Kevin wasn't given a name here, he was referred to as Sean's bodyguard, Sean's insurance policy, and Sean's Great Wall of China. It was Shane McMahon who suggested the name Diesel, stemming from Nash coming from the motor city of Detroit, Michigan. Kevin would also get rid of that tracksuit, thankfully, and he said his new look was inspired by Elvis Presley's 1968 comeback special. It took a while for Kevin to get the Diesel look though, at the King of the Ring in 1993 Diesel wore all denim, and his assignment was to once again stand at ringside and provide support for Michaels, at least on surface level. What Nash was really doing here though, he was learning. Kevin admitted to being very, very green when he came to the WWF, even though he'd spent a few years in WCW. Every night, Kevin Nash would watch Shawn Michaels, he wasn't learning Shawn's moves, he knew he'd be working in a very different way when compared to the Heartbreak Kid, but Kevin said he learned about match psychology, he learned about the nuances of pro wrestling, he learned about timing, and Kevin said watching Shawn Michaels wrestle guys from the top of the card to the bottom was one of the best in-ring educations he could have ever hoped to receive. In return, Kevin would give Sean life lessons. Sean said in some social areas of his life he wasn't great, he wasn't good at talking to new people, and Kevin gave Sean advice about how to carry himself when out and about. Michael said Kevin was almost like a big brother in this respect. It's almost like Sean was helping Kevin professionally while Kevin helped Sean personally. 
Kevin watched Sean wrestle for around six weeks before he got his first match in the WWF, a tag team match where he and Sean teamed up to face Razor Ramon and Marty Jannetty. The WWE stated in their recent Two Dudes with Attitudes documentary that this happened on July 27, 1993. However, Cagematch.net doesn't even have this match listed at all. The records state that Diesel didn't wrestle until August of 1993, so we don't know the exact date when Diesel stepped in the ring. The match that was shown on the documentary was taped for a Coliseum video known as Inside the WWF. Maybe the documentary meant to say that this was Diesel's first match that was actually taped for distribution. If we completely remove this from the equation, the first time Diesel wrestled on TV and not on home video was on the 4th of October 1993 episode of Raw, where he competed in a battle royal to decide who should wrestle for the IC Championship the following week. Sean got himself suspended and his Intercontinental Championship was up for grabs. Diesel did not win the battle royal, but he'd prove himself in over the top rope matches the following year at the Royal Rumble. In the meantime though, with Sean out of action, Diesel had to step in the ring more to keep his character in the public eye. Michaels would return in time for the 1993 Survivor Series, but he and Diesel were featured in different Survivor Series matchups. Diesel teamed up with Adam Bomb, IRS, and Rick Martel to take on Mr. Perfect, Razor Ramon, The Kid, and Marty Jannetty, while Shawn Michaels led a team of knights to face the Hart family. HBK replaced Jerry Lawler here due to the King getting in some legal trouble. Shawn Michaels wore the IC Championship at Survivor Series, and he'd continue to do so in the weeks that followed, still claiming to be the Intercontinental Champion even though he was officially stripped of the belt. Razor Ramon was the current IC Champion, and this would all lead to the classic ladder match pitting Shawn Michaels against Razor Ramon at WrestleMania 10. Before that though, in the Royal Rumble, Diesel had an incredible showing in the Royal Rumble match. In one of the earliest examples of fans really getting behind a bad guy in the World Wrestling Federation, Diesel dominated the bout while the crowd chanted his name. Big Daddy Cool entered the match and he eliminated seven guys before a team of wrestlers had to join forces to get Diesel out of the ring. HBK even helped in getting his friend eliminated. This was a great example of the Royal Rumble getting used to elevate somebody though, and Vince McMahon noticed the reaction that Diesel received during his performance. 1994 would turn out to be a big year for Kevin Nash. Sean had an outstanding, trend-setting match with Razor Ramon at WrestleMania 10, but he failed to become the undisputed Intercontinental Champion when all was said and done. Diesel, on the other hand, was able to defeat Razor on the 13th of April 1994. The match was taped for WWF Superstars and it aired on the 30th. Diesel became the Intercontinental Champion, his first big singles title in the World Wrestling Federation, and you may think this would lead to Sean getting tossed aside as the WWF continued to push Diesel, but this wasn't the case. Sean had begun his own interview segment, The Heartbreak Hotel, and if you watch these segments back today, you'll understand why HBK was still very important to the growth of the Diesel character. Diesel's mic work wasn't good, whereas Shawn Michaels had the ability to make things up on the spot and talk a lot better. Diesel was beginning to get more promo time, he'd have to learn pretty fast too, seeing as he was about to get his first WWF title opportunity on pay per view against Bret the Hitman Hart at King of the Ring. But watch Diesel's promos around this time period and you'll see what I mean. He was nowhere near as good as what he'd eventually become in terms of his talking abilities. Diesel was still learning on the job. At the King of the Ring, Diesel was unable to win the WWF Championship, but Big Daddy Cool was definitely more confident at this pay-per-view. He cut a live promo before the match that was fine, and the match he had with the Hitman was also good, even though there was a ton, and I mean a ton, of outside interference from Shawn Michaels and Jim Neidhart. Brett's family feud storyline was front and center here. The match ended when Neidhart interfered and the referee disqualified the Hitman, and after this match we would learn that the Anvil was actually siding with Brett's little brother Owen. There was no long term plans for a Diesel vs Bret Hart rivalry here at all, but still, the big man was now getting big matches while Shawn Michaels stayed on the outside. Sean and Diesel would then win the Tag Team Championships at a house show on August 28th, meaning Diesel was a double champion, but Razor Ramon would defeat Big Daddy Cool the following night at SummerSlam, meaning Diesel's double champion status was very, very short-lived. 
Still, HBK and Big Daddy Cool were now the tag team champions. It felt like there was never really a time when there wasn't a championship belt involved when it came to Diesel and Sean, and it's absolutely no secret that both guys, Sean in particular, were playing politics to keep the belts around their waists. Razor Ramon was also part of this. These three wanted to work together in the ring, have fun and swap the IC title around, and eventually, Sean Waltman and Triple H would, of course, become part of this group of friends known as The Click. But when it came to actual title belts, it felt like Sean, Diesel and Razor were the guys who always carried the gold. I don't feel like I need to go into the whole click thing here and I want to keep this focused on Sean and Diesel. Maybe in the future I'll put up a full click video, but it goes without saying that these guys were looking out for themselves during this time period. Even though Sean and Diesel just won the tag team titles, their on-screen partnership was beginning to suffer. Sean cost Diesel the IC title at SummerSlam when he accidentally superkicked Big Daddy Cool, and after the match it looked like Diesel wasn't too happy with HBK. Following SummerSlam, it looked like Diesel and Sean had sorted out their differences. They only had a few televised title defenses, but from what we saw, the superkick at SummerSlam had been forgotten about and the partnership remained. At Survivor Series, Sean and Diesel were part of the Teamsters along with Owen Hart, Jim Neidhart and Jeff Jarrett. They faced the bad guys consisting of Razor Ramon, the 123 Kid, Davey Boy Smith and the Head Shrinkers that now featured the Barbarian. Once again, Shawn Michaels accidentally superkicked Big Diesel and the tag team would immediately split up afterwards and the tag titles would get vacated. Some may see this as a bad thing seeing as the team had been pretty successful up to this point, but way, way bigger things were just around the corner. Diesel won the WWF Championship days after splitting up with HBK. McMahon pulled the trigger due to the reactions Diesel had been getting from fans all across America. And as for Shawn Michaels, well, his journey from this point onwards would lead to some big accomplishments for the Heartbreak Kid. Kevin said, When Diesel beat Bob Backlund, Diesel hadn't had 200 matches. Sean lobbied to be the champion. There were no hard feelings for me or him, but I knew that was Sean's dream. It wasn't mine. Shawn Michaels said, We all get in this to have that moment. It's an acknowledgement, it's affirmation. It's one of those things where you really begin to realize, just at the moment where you feel the jealousy is going to set in, you're overcome with, that's gotta be very cool for him. And I got to help with that. I can remember in the garden telling him, I'm proud of you, I want you to enjoy this. Would I like to have this someday for me? Yes. But I gotta tell you, don't ever let anyone stir shit between us. No matter what you hear from anybody, I'm happy for you. That's when you know the friendship was real. Diesel vs Sean was the natural matchup the WWF wanted to build towards, but it wouldn't happen on Raw, it wouldn't happen at the Raw Rumble, this match would get featured at WrestleMania. So to get the mania, Sean won the Raw Rumble after entering the match at number 1, the first time such a feat had ever been accomplished. And as for Diesel, Diesel basked in the fan adulation right up until WrestleMania. He had another great pay per view match against Bret Hart at the 1995 Raw Rumble before making it the mania. And by the time the big pay per view had arrived, Diesel was almost like a completely different guy in terms of confidence. At mania though, the fans weren't behind Big Daddy Cool as much as the WWF would have hoped. Fans began to cheer for Michaels and much of this was to do with how the match was booked. Sean protested a few spots in the bout, knowing full well that fans wouldn't play along with what the WWF wanted both guys to do, but the match played out as originally intended and it led to fans booing Diesel while cheering for Sean. I'll cover all of this in a future video by the way. This is a match worth dissecting and it's another one where we can get more information from reading interviews and whatnot. Diesel leaves WrestleMania still the champion, and because of how fans reacted to Michaels at WrestleMania, the decision was made to turn Sean babyface by having his new bodyguard Sid attack him on Raw. Diesel ran down for the save, so it looks like Sean and Diesel may once again be back together, only this time there's a whole new dynamic. They're both now good guys. Before SummerSlam, this would have been a ridiculous thought. There was nothing redeeming at all about Michaels and Diesel in terms of their wrestling characters. You'd imagine that the WWF would have gotten much more mileage out of the Sean vs Diesel feud, but it wasn't meant to be.
Diesel would feud with Big Sid while Sean went away briefly. The WWF wanted to ensure that HBK got a good reaction upon his return. Sean came back in time to compete in the 1995 King of the Ring. He then won the Intercontinental Championship again, beating Jeff Jarrett in an excellent match at In Your House 2, while Diesel defeated Sid in a rematch from In Your House 1. Sean's match was awesome, while Diesel and Sid didn't exactly set the world on fire. Diesel and Sean had the two top singles belts in the World Wrestling Federation. They were the most popular superstars in the company. And if all this wasn't enough, they also wanted the tag team titles. This, according to Sean and Diesel, seriously pissed off a lot of people backstage, but they didn't care. As a matter of fact, they loved it. Neither Sean nor Kevin hide the fact that, back then, they would do anything they could to stir the pot because, really, they were untouchable. Vince McMahon would listen to Sean and the Click quite a lot in regards to creative decisions and Vince, evidently, went along with a lot of their suggestions. Kevin Nash would say Shawn Michaels was the only guy he ever saw verbally rip McMahon apart without repercussions, and it was this kind of environment that led to Shawn, Diesel and company having so much stroke. Shawn and Diesel defeated Cam Cornette at In Your House 3 to win the tag team titles. Diesel would say they were the two dudes with attitudes, the chops with all the straps, but the dominating reign at the top really didn't last long. A technicality meant that Shawn and Diesel would have to forfeit the titles, saying as Owen Hart was pinned in the match and Owen was actually replaced by the Bulldog before the match even began. So this big scary run with the two dudes with attitudes holding all the gold didn't even get started. Still, many of the guys backstage didn't know the plans, and the mere idea of Sean and Diesel holding all the belts was enough to make some guys very upset. Sean said, Kevin and I have all the championships in the WWF, and the locker room hates us. In any other line of work, any two other human beings would say, no, we don't need that. We relished it. That's the kind of thing that, years later, you look at it and they're cool stories to tell now, but you shouldn't enjoy having people hate you as much as we did. With HBK getting the mega push in 1995, the problem the WWF now had was the fact that Diesel and Sean were just too big to remain a tag team, at least on a full-time basis. Diesel was still the WWF champion, but Vince wanted to put the title on Sean at next year's WrestleMania. Bret Hart vs Shawn Michaels would be the big match, so Diesel dropped the belt to Bret at Survivor Series 95. After the run Diesel had as WWF Champion, he really couldn't have complained too much either. After losing to Bret at Survivor Series, Diesel became a tweener. He'd work against bad guys some nights, he'd work against baby faces on others. He remained popular no matter what way people try to spin it. And he kept the WWF title for a year, and that definitely counts for something. But it was time to put an end to the Diesel WWF Champion project and move on to Shawn Michaels, who by this time had become way more more popular. In February of 1996, Diesel decided he was going to leave the WWF and go to WCW. He said he was having fun in the WWF, but he also wanted to get paid. He also had a baby son on the way, so Kevin wanted to fulfill his dream of becoming wealthy, while Sean could fulfill his dream of winning the WWF Championship. Kevin Nash would be the first one to confirm this too, he said it multiple times. He got into wrestling to make money and that's exactly what he would do by going back to WCW. From his time spent in the WWF, Kevin Nash became a much more attractive commodity. Having Sean in his corner fighting his battles resulted in Vinny Vegas becoming a heavyweight champion and it was time for Nash to move on and apply everything he learned to his new role in WCW. Nash now had a ton of new knowledge in regards to navigating himself backstage. Sean wasn't happy, he was losing both Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, two friends he had spent the best part of three years with. But the future outsiders assured Sean that this would be a good thing for the group. Scott Hall said it would be like the click taking over wrestling. There'd be a click north and a click south. And with the group headlining the two biggest wrestling companies in the United States, they'd be completely unstoppable. You can kind of see this too in a way with the NWO and DX, the forefathers of both groups being clique members who rose to prominence during the new generation era. They even acted the same way on occasion during live television shows. 
So before leaving, Kevin Nash wanted to put over The Undertaker, which he did at WrestleMania 12, and he'd also lose to Shawn Michaels. HBK was the WWF champion by the time this match got booked. The Good Friends Better Enemies No Holds Barred match was a great way for Kevin to go out. It was one of his best matches ever in the WWF. Things didn't quite work out when we talk about a click north and a click south. It was going well in late 1997, but by the time 1998 came around, the wheels began falling off. There were a few creative slip-ups with the NWO, and Shawn Michaels was forced into an early retirement following WrestleMania 14. Over in WCW, Nash would become a world champion, he'd land himself some booking duties, and he'd also find himself getting a ton of backlash from fans in the know. Nash would take the blame for many of WCW's shortcomings, whether they were his decisions or not. You have to look at the impact both guys had though with the NWO and the beginning of DEX. NWO became the biggest, most talked about storyline and faction in the wrestling world, while DEX helped to usher in the WWF's Attitude Era. You gotta believe that without the NWO storyline and without the Attitude Era, then pro wrestling would probably look very different to what it does today. Nonetheless, after the WCW buyout and after his Time Warner contract expired, Kevin Nash made a return to the WWE as part of the NWO. A little while after Hollywood Hogan left the group in 2002, Shawn Michaels made a comeback as part of the NWO, so the two dudes with attitudes were back in the limelight. Shawn would eventually step back in the ring, but by the time that happened, Kevin Nash had already gotten himself injured, though in 2003 they were able to briefly team up together. By this point, both guys had come such a long way from wearing tracksuits and sporting mullets. Both guys had incredibly successful careers behind them. Many will say they politic their way to the top. Others would say you gotta do what you gotta do to get to the top. Whatever side you're on, no one can take away how popular and successful both guys were. Sean and Kevin totally embrace it, they know they rubbed people the wrong way, and they fully admit to enjoying it too. So when fans online are screaming about how these guys were assholes and how they kept people down while keeping their own spot safe, Sean and Kevin just shrug their shoulders and say, so what? They completely own it, and that's worth something too. That'll do it for this one guys, I could have talked on here about the click, the Wrestlemania 11 match, even the good friends better enemies bout deserves a little more time but I'll get to all these topics in the future. I just wanted to cover the main talking points in regards to the two dudes with attitudes, the chops with all the straps, the pricks with all the chicks. Thanks for watching and take care.